Good morning to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today. Alan Clements here from Santa Monica, California, June 19th, 2021. Today is the second iteration of my tribute to Do Aung San Suu Kyi, my friend, ally, Dhamma sister, mentor. <clears throat> the elected state counselor of the country of Myanmar, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991, who has spent upwards of 17 years in prison and in detention and in house arrest. She, at this very moment, is in an indisclosed location somewhere in Myanmar, detained, incarcerated, and being paraded before the people of Burma and the world community, the United Nations, all civilized countries, in an Orwellian military tribunal based on total fabrications, lies, manipulations, distortions, and otherwise evil incantations from the former senior general of Burma, known by the name Ming Online. I think it's worthy to note this man's name, Ming Online, and begin to compare him to the earliest stages of Pol Pot in Cambodia to the worst of evils in the desecration of the people at this moment in Burma and the incarceration of Do Aung San Suu Kyi. I'd like to share spontaneously uh, a tribute to her, my personal relationship to Burma, and may I enjoy this moment with you to become force activi uh, activizers and share this video, excuse me, share this video as much as you possibly can for the betterment of the people of Burma and in support of the state councillor Do Aung San Suu Kyi. So from my heart to yours, thank you for tuning in. In thinking about this sharing today, and there's a part of me, a large part of me, that is trying to understand how best to communicate why I am deeply involved in the crisis in Burma, with the people of Burma, why that matters. And I can't tell you what to do. I can only share why Burma is important to me and do the best I can within my own limited ability to provide a bridge perhaps where you can find connectivity to begin to activate your own voice, your own passions, your own love, deeper love of freedom, your love of democracy, and feel more of this interrelatedness of life that democracy in Burma and the desecration of human rights in Burma is not in a foreign country. That's an illusion. A refugee in Burma is a refugee worldwide. A political prisoner in insane prison in Yangon, Myanmar, is a prisoner in our own country. We're bound and connected by dignity, by conscience, and by the universality of human rights, environmental rights. And I'd like to provide today, as best as I can, a dive into how to feel the inseparable nature of democracy and freedom, universal human rights, equally in the way that we share the oxygen worldwide. A non-apartheid approach to freedom, democracy, and activism why a person in Canada, Australia, Spain, Italy, Germany, America, here in Los Angeles, why it is important for us 
to respond and to relate to the people of Burma at this moment in, in time. I respect and admire Do Aung San Suu Kyi, but knowing her to the extent that I do, if she were speaking through me right now, if I could be that, that direct, I feel confident that she would say, I represent the will of the people, an elected civilian in a democratic government that has been violated by Ming Online and his satanic evil organization known as Mossack. I am not just an independent celebrity. I'm not just Do Aung San Suu Kyi. These are my words. I am here to serve the people. What do I hear in my statement of serving the people? Serving their well-being, serving their security, serving their right to freedom from need and freedom from fear, serving their need for an education on the terms of high quality and the standards worldwide, serving them in the establishing of rule of law, serving them in harmonizing as best as we can as a nation, all the various ethnic groups throughout the country, all the various religions around the country, my role as an elected official speaking again for Da Aung San Suu Kyi voluntarily from my own heart. I am here not as a symbol of hope, but as a servant of the people, a servant of freedom, an advocate for democracy. How can we expand from those values and principles and in institutions in Myanmar to belong to a globalization of freedom, a globalization of rule of law, a globalization of independent thinking. Today, we are so inseparably bound by information, technology, oxygen, water, resources. The calamity of the ecosystem will affect the entire planet, including non-humans. What's going on in Burma? One country, one of the 193 countries at the United Nations, a family of countries bound by a three-page doctrine, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is being violated in the most vicious way in Burma. And it is our solemn, spiritual, psychological, democratic duty as global citizens to hear the needs of the people and to respond as best as we can humanly to their needs in their moment of crisis, which is urgent and right now. When I think of Burma, I think of nonviolence. I think of ethical courage. I hear in my own heart, who are these people who have been imprisoned? Pause. In Burma today, Imagine this happening in America, in San Francisco, in New York, in Los Angeles, in Vancouver, in Melbourne, Sydney, Byron Bay, anywhere in the world. Imagine you are living in a university setting. You are living in your business setting. You are living in your educational setting. You are living in your restaurant, your cafe. You are living in your vocation. You are living as a poet, a filmmaker, a journalist, a doctor, a nurse, a taxi cab, a rickshaw driver, a nun, a monk, an artist, a poet, an author, a senior monk, a seido, a tila shin, a Burmese Buddhist nun, a priest, an atheist, a Jew, a Muslim, You are living under a civilian government elected fairly, appropriately by the people, the will of the people. A military institution 
comes out and says, this is inappropriate. This is wrong. What you are doing is not to my liking. It's illegal. It's a lie. And we are going to incarcerate the elected officials based upon your will, population. We're going to put all the congressmen and congresswomen and the president who have been dutifully elected by the people in a free and fair election, we're going to imprison them. We're going to torture them. We're going to send a message to you, America, that if you want freedom and democracy and universal human rights and the right to do what you want, to say what you want, to preach what you want, to go to the church in the meditation center of your choice, you will die. Welcome to Burma under the terrorist Ming Online and his terrorist group known as the State Administration Council. They are no longer an armed forces. He has imprisoned Do Aung San Suu Kyi and the President U Win Mint and 5,200 other men and women who are filmmakers, doctors, nurses, poets, influencers, models, I mean, everyone's important, but imagine the American military, the Canadian military, the Australian military, the German, the Italian, this totally coming into homes, onto streets, peaceful protesters. You will die. You will be raped. You will be tortured. That is so wrong. And as an artist, a spoken word artist, a meditator, a yogi, an author, a poet, hello, artists in Burma are routinely tortured for their art, for their conscience, for their dignity, for their poetry, doctors and nurses, a woman and a man who gives birth to life are being killed, raped by this devilish organization known as Mossack. And just yesterday, the United Nations as a body routinely in their vote, moderately chastised the evil empire in Burma that's dominating Do Aung San Suu Kyi and the president and all the artists and the doctors and the teachers and the 54 million people of the country. And we allow that? A tribute to Da Aung San Suu Kyi is a tribute to spiritual, psychological outrage. I think it was Martin Luther King that made mention of the word sacred rage. I'm not sure that I can quote him exactly. But for every black man and woman that you beat with your white baton, we have another 10, 20, 50, 100 black women and men ready to be beaten by your baton. That's outrageous. For every church you burn, we have another 100 we'll build to be burned. Your white man laws are so outmoded and we have the power of God and Dhamma in our hearts. We are sacredly outraged and we will not be stopped. Welcome to Burma. Welcome to Do Aung San Suu Kyi. Welcome to the people of that beloved country right now who are not only not giving up the struggle, are rolling up their sleeves and finding creative ways of how to continue what's known worldwide as a revolution of the spirit. Ming Online, the terrorist leader, has attempted to silence the people that speak like me. Very, very few of them are left. We have them in books. We have them on audio tape, on some films. But Do Aung San Suu Kyi, 
many, many of the poets, writers, authors, intellectuals, filmmakers, musicians, they're taking and imprisoning the Trent Reznors of the Nine Inch Nails in Burma. They're taking, imprisoning, and torturing the Nick Caves in Burma. They're taking, imprisoning, and killing the Leonard Cohens in Burma. They're taking and killing the Jack Della Roaches in Burma, Rage Against the Machine, Nine Inch Nails. They are taking and killing rock, spoken word, poetry, actors, models. We're not cool with that, artists. We're not down with that. Da Aung San Suu Kyi, we're not supporting her as icon. She represents, and I know firsthand, having done many, many conversations with her in a number of different books, I represent the people. I represent as best as I can as woman, as being a servant of freedom and democracy. Every one of us know the only way that we can achieve democracy is everyone who does and fulfills their duty. Influencers and artists around the world, a tribute to Da Aung San Suu Kyi on her birthday today, is not having to love her or applaud her or the other people imprisoned. It's to understand the universality and the interrelatedness of artistry, of freedom and democracy as a global ecosystem. We belong to a global family. The United Nations is the best that we have. They can only do what they can do. It is up to the people of the world the Burmese people of the world, the Shan people of the world, the Karin people of the world, Kaya, Chin, Rakhine, Mon, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists. Let me pause. I am an activist some of the time and a yogi most of the time. What I mean by that, Da Aung San Suu Kyi and Utinu, Uwe Mong, Uwintain, Uchimong, so many others introduced me to what has become known worldwide as Dhamma in action. We all know how to meditate and do asana as a yogi on a mat, but how do you take conscience and dignity and loving kindness and compassion and patience, and fortitude, and the power of the human mind as a revolutionary tool to confront the injustices of evil through the power of nonviolence, the firmness of a radical compassion that is willing to get into the face of the bully and stand your ethical, spiritual ground and talk sense into the bully as best as you can rather than reverting to the ignorance of the bully. Burma represents Dhamma, spirituality, democracy, freedom, revolution in action. There is no cliche in that. We are all revolutionaries if we couple the deep regard for ethical, spiritual, mindful courage, knowing what are the states of mind that are most valuable to confront injustice, evil, violence, denigration, propaganda, and essentially dictatorial totalitarianism. What are the qualities of consciousness required within consciousness as a meditator to employ through voice, hands, text, art, music, voting, and doing all that we can to live in the revolutionary expression of Dhamma in action, dynamic action, 
That is Burma today. Rare in the world do we see so many radically compelling, courageous activists, and they are being obliterated, tortured and raped, and Gen Z and Gen X, and a lot of other people in Burma are saying, we refuse to be defeated. We're just beginning the next wave of the revolution. Do Aung San Suu Kyi on her birthday, she is a representative of the revolution of the majority of the people. That is what we're paying tribute to today. And may I encourage you, wherever you are in your religion, your philosophy, your spirituality, no matter what form of meditation you practice, wherever you are, whatever citizen you are, whatever nation you are, whatever language you are, we cherish in our dharma, our religion, our respect for our own personal relationship to either atheism or to God, the quality of freedom. I look at these hands and if they were taken from me, I could not touch myself or another. If for some reason I lost my eyes and I could not see, think of the freedom inherent in being able to look and choose what you want to look at. That is the quality of freedom. To be able to walk from here to the store without fear of violence, persecution, or unlawful incarceration. Burma, you cannot do that. Here in America, you can. Think of that freedom being taken from you. Think of when your daughter leaves your home that she would be violated and potentially raped by Ming Online's evil incantation of a military turned terrorist group. And think of the sacred Dhamma outrage that would be so, so available to you. That's Burma. That's why we're standing up in this tribute for Do Aung San Suu Kyi. It's a tribute not only to the people of Burma, it's a dedication for all of us worldwide to activate, to feel the interconnectedness of democracy, human rights, and their violation of democracy and human rights in Burma, and feel it as a violation of our own dignity, our own conscience, our own culture, our own civilization, and bond with the people. It won't be long before Xi Jinping in China, Putin in Russia, Ming Online in Myanmar, the corporate oligarchs around the world, the tech titans. Think of that firewall around 1.4 billion Chinese people right now. Just think of a firewall around your community, wherever you are right now. Think of a firewall, which means not only can you not get hip, cool music or films or art or chat rooms or dialogues or books or films all filtered out, but the firewall has a proactive propaganda. You are told lies and you have social credit scores that mark everything that you think, everything that you do. Every little search that you make on your phone and your computer is tracked and evaluated. And you get the euphemistic social credit that they have in China. It's called Totalitarian 101. Control and enslave the people. The violation of the people of Burma is the march of totalitarianism. Fergus and I, my colleague, Fergus Harlow and I, we have outlined in our books, Burma's Voices of Freedom, the march of totalitarianism. And we've given voice to the freedom fighters in Burma. And I asked over a decade the questions, talk to me about the psychology of dictatorship and what can you do to share what you have learned for the people of the world, how to challenge dictatorship and totalitarianism. If these books were smuggled into prison 
cells around the world with political prisoners in their own native language, what would you say to them? The violation in Burma is really the violation of totalitarianism on the march and the desecration, the attempted destruction of freedom of mind, freedom of speech, the ability to dream in the safety and the creativity of my own heart with my own friends in my own synagogue, in my own meditation center, in my own living room. I want to live in freedom. And right now in Burma, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, the president, thousands of other men and women, there's an attempt to suppress and to silence them, putting them into prison camps, interrogating them, torturing them in such a different variety of ways. And in some cases, I dare even use the word, raping the women. That is so evil, so prehistoric, such an aberrant DNA in the genetics of this ecosystem of existence that we are all embedded. Yes, spiritually, that is my vocation to do all that I possibly can to challenge my own complicity with my own darkness, my own evil, and to do all I can to support the well-being of other brothers and sisters in other places in the world. <clears throat> Why am I so passionate about Burma? It comes to two words, Dhamma life. I think many of you know the word Dhamma and the Sanskrit word Dharma. I'll soon go to the island of Maui on the 25th of June, where I'm very much looking forward to this July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, very informal but radically intimate gathering of a few people where I'll be staying with an adjacent little temple hall on the side of my cottage. And it'll be the first occasion for me personally in nearly a year and a half to interact with others in a setting such as this. I'm very much looking forward to learning, to listening, and to sharing there. It'll be broadcast for those of you who may want to participate on those days from 10 to 4. We'll put out a notice. It'll be broadcast here as a live stream worldwide. My point, though, is it's rooted in the Dhamma life. I don't know what else to say about it. The Dhamma life is that trans-religious vocation, which I can feel in people's heart and mind. How dedicated is she and he to the transformation of their own consciousness. How well do they embody revolutionary intimacy with the confluence of consciousness in the context of their senses and the object of their senses and the emotionality associated with the objects of their senses and to be mindfully committed to the emotionality is it producing conflict, fear, ignorance, propaganda, or does it illuminate compassion, freedom, democracy, safety, and the elevation of freedom and possibly even enlightenment itself? Dhamma, the Dhamma life. Burma is my Dhamma home. I am so down with knowing that. I was a lower class, ordinary boy growing up on the East Coast of America with two beloved parents doing the best that they could to survive post-World War II, both of them veterans of the war, 
being pulled up and down the East Coast in a 30-foot trailer with my brother, military installation to military base, growing up with jet aircraft, hearing them screaming day and night, visiting my dad before he'd go out on cruises and when he'd come back on aircraft carriers and battleships. My friends were Marines. I bring this up. I went from there to the University of Virginia on a scholarship. I knew the importance of independent thinking. I was disciplined. I wasn't necessarily that smart, but I was tenacious. And I learned to read and to write and slowly learned how to communicate. And then eventually I felt this deep urge to fulfill the vocation of my life, which was I no longer want to become rich or famous or in love. I want to understand the secret things of consciousness. I want to understand a non-fabricated narrative of just essential meditation, which means how to actualize Dhamma. It's not just sitting in meditation, watching your breath. How to live the Dhamma life is the vocation of the meditator. And so I read books and eventually I was so inspired by a book written by a Burmese Buddhist monk. Practical Mindfulness Insight Meditation Instructions by the late, great, venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. I knew upon reading that Burma was where I wanted to go, and I went. And I was blessed through the serendipity of chance and karma and support by others, primarily the people of Burma, to be allowed to stay in that country, ordain as a monk under the tutelage of the Mahasi Sayadaw, and learn under his guidance Dhamma and meditation. The beauty and the sanctity of community. The beauty of generosity. The people of Burma introduced me to the concept of dana. Open-hearted giving. Your life is in joy of what you can share. The way to overcome your own pride and stinginess and greed is to share openly what you have, not just with friends and family, but make your life an expression of your Dhamma, your Dhamma Dana. And I had people come to my room when I was ill, who I didn't even know. Who wiped my brow, I put moisture on my lips when I couldn't move my hands from an operation and hepatitis. You know, when you're ill and even possibly dying, and those who come who are not nurses and doctors, but people who have a mutual love of Dhamma in meditation, the family goes so much deeper than just your community. Burma and the people of Burma not only introduced me to intimate sacred community and the power of Dhamma interrelatedness, but they showed me unconditional loving kindness, unconditional compassion, and provided for me without financial charge, which is really amazing, a chance to explore consciousness, my own mind, to embody the Dhamma life, to embody the meditative life, to do all that I possibly could to study the machinations of the revolution of human consciousness, the overcoming of greed, anger, and delusion, and the elevation of love, compassion, generosity, and freedom. And in that context, I was introduced to dictatorship, introduced to totalitarianism, by those who had been imprisoned under the dictator. It was so interesting to me to be in the midst of this elegant, sacred Dhamma culture 
and to have people come to the monastery who had been in prison for six, eight, ten, twelve years in solitary confinement simply for the way they think, what they write, their poetry, their music, their artistry, their journalism, their business. Or just simply because you were disliked by the dictator and his friends and cronies, you were imprisoned. And I met these people. And it so activated something in me that one or a group of people could denigrate other people like this and just imprison you. And as time went on, I was thrown out of the country and removed from my Dhamma family. And I wept and it was hard for me. And then came on to the scene Do Aung San Suu Kyi in 88. And the 8888 revolutionaries, all of whom either were imprisoned or fled or killed. And here we are, what, how many decades later? And the same revolution is going on. The reason I'm involved, it's not so much political alone. It's the love and the response to the Dhamma in that country. It is so special and so sacred. And Do Aung San Suu Kyi and about 10 of her colleagues introduced me, helped me understand, mentored me along the Dhamma life and putting Dhamma into action politically. And from my heart to all of you, what an amazing gift. That's what's at stake in Burma. It is not just democracy or universal human rights. Yes, those are essential, but it's Dhamma as a meditative vocation coupled with the strident, courageous, ongoing, indefatigable expression of love, compassion, patience, determination, democracy, and freedom in action seen through the civil disobedience movement in Burma. We have so much to learn from them. The new movies coming out, the books that we've provided, Burma's Voices of Freedom, from the older generation to the younger generation, they are living testaments of freedom fighters' wisdom over decades they will be manuals for revolution for time immemorial as long as life exists on this planet. Allow me to close here in the last third of this sharing I pause because there's so many compelling angles about Burma for me. It's such a, I use the word Dhamma teaching here, not so much as a Buddhist expression, but Dhamma is a trans-religious term, like the word Dharma, world Dhamma, world Dharma. It's trans-religious. It just simply points to the, the nature of the human experience in consciousness through the senses in consideration to the five aggregates of being, form, feeling, perception, mental cognition, consciousness, through the six senses, with regard to the three characteristics of impermanence, emptiness of self, unsatisfaction, based upon causality, and the inability to control the phenomena of existence. This, this Dhamma in Burma has spread worldwide. Many of the people there, including Unu Tome, the former prime minister, that Dhamma is our greatest export. It's not Buddhism. Yes, Buddhists in Burma call themselves 
Dhamma upholders, but it's really a trans-religious, totally trans-religious, trans-philosophical vocation of direct experience with the phenomenology of consciousness. And that is so amazing and yet so concealed in the country. Now, coming to the end here, I'm just trying to examine what the, the deepest wish I have right now for Do Aung San Suu Kyi, Wu Win Yen, the president, the deepest wish, the deepest hope. I so wish that I could address the United Nations. This is the best that I can offer right now. But I really wish that I could stand before the United Nations like Greta Thunberg did on September 19th, 2019 and talked briefly to the 193 delegates of the civilized countries of our planet. I wish I could, I wish I would be invited to address the United Nations for 20 minutes and talk to them about why Burma matters and about the igniting of conscience, not to preach, but to reveal my own personal relationship to Do Aung San Suu Kyi, having co-authored The Voice of Hope together, my 43-year involvement. It's not a political talk. But as Do Aung San Suu Kyi inspired me in what she called a revolution of the spirit. She told me very directly when I met her for the first time. I think I would tell the United Nations this, this very simple story. That when we met in 1995 after her release from the first six years of incarceration, she told me that a journalist had asked her how it felt to be free. And she said to him, and what she told me, I never thought of myself as unfree. My freedom is of consciousness and it's not anyone's to take. Imagine being so disciplined, not just in theory. Burma requires dynamic activism to be engaged in consciousness to understand freedom. And we walked to the front gate and I just stood there. And I met her days later. And I said, Dosu, you've called your struggle for freedom a revolution of the spirit. In essence, United Nations, leaders of the free world, what do you mean by that, Dosu? Tell them. It takes freedom and courage to confront injustice and dictatorship nonviolently. You were out on the street, Alan. A hundred people gathered, all of whom defied totalitarian state law not to gather in groups of five or more. Everyone risked and risks imprisonment, torture, rape, death disappearance, loss of home, loss of income. That takes courage, ethical courage, spiritual courage. You ask what is the essence of 
our revolution of the spirit? Courage. In a nutshell, the courage, she said, to see the truth of a circumstance. This is unjust. This is wrong. Have that level of discernment. The courage to discern, to inquire, and to question. The courage to see that in yourself as a violation. And then the courage, she said, to feel the truth of your understanding born from your relationship to dignity and conscience and your love of freedom. You must feel it. You just can't live in the thought. That's meditation. The deep capacity to infiltrate, to personalize through the interiorization of states of heart. The inner yoga of freedom, dignity, and conscience. That is Da Aung San Suu Kyi. That was 26 years ago. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands other nuns and monks and men and women in the country who live and breathe exactly what she said to me all those years back. The essence, 193 representatives of the free world, is ethical, spiritual conscience. The courage to feel the truth of something. And she said, courage is to see truth, feel truth, and to act. So rad to embrace three letters, A-C-T, ACT. Action. Action. Take action. I would say to the United Nations, to leaders of the free world, take ethical, democratic, deep love of freedom action to enact the United Nations principle of the right to protect and throw out dissenting voices as uncivilized, evil infiltrators of the sacred institution of the United Nations. They are not democratic nations. Dictatorship, totalitarianism should not be allowed in the United Nations. That's a problem. It should not be allowed on the Security Council. We must as civilized lovers of freedom and democracy, especially leaders, we must protect members of our family as we would protect members of our blood family. There is no separation between the two. I would engage the 193 members of the United Nations and I would encourage everything humanly possible to enact the 2007 principle of the United Nations of the right to protect the people of Myanmar. Failing to act on that universal agreement rooted in conscience and in the reason the United Nations exists, Eleanor Roosevelt and colleagues in the formation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights decades ago, post-World War II, 
That is why you are a representative of the United Nations. Otherwise, like Ming Online, like Xi Jinping in China, what they have done to the Tibetans, to the Uyghurs, to the Hong Kongers, to the people of their own country in China. Not only is that wrong, they should be ousted and removed and despite what they say, act for Da Aung San Suu Kyi. It is not enough to celebrate a birthday being paraded before a military tribunal in an undisclosed prison camp somewhere in Burma where she is likely to spend her remaining years silenced, imprisoned. We have an opportunity to stand for her and the people of Burma. Now, I want to close now and I will continue part three of this tomorrow, the final part. Um, God willing, a tribute to Da Aung San Suu Kyi in defense of freedom, in support of democracy both in Burma and in support of democracy and freedom for the unborn on this planet. I realize that we are few, but there's something in the strength of character, in the strength of our own ethical intelligence, our own spiritual wisdom, our own transformational courage. It's something mighty about that recognition. There's something profoundly empowering to honor your own Dana Sila Bhavana, your own commitment to generosity, your own commitment to ethical intelligence, your own commitment to skillful speech and action, your own commitment to the vocation of the transformation of your own mind, the revolution of your own spirit. And closing here with Dosu's words, Alan, you asked me, United Nations, you asked me, what do I symbolize? What do I stand for? What have I made choices for since 1988 when I returned to my country? I have chosen the vocation of freedom in action. I call it a revolution of the human heart, a revolution of consciousness. Each of us endowed with reason and inquiry and clear comprehension. If we achieve peace in society, we must understand how to bring peace into our own consciousness. That is the revolution in Burma. That's why we're choosing the nonviolent approach. The root of that, 193 nations and leaders around the world, is ethical, spiritual, transreligious courage to bring democracy and rule of law and justice and harmony and freedom to the people requires ethical courage to belong to a human family, right? These are not just platitudes. A human family, Da Aung San Suu Kyi is our sister, our mother, our daughter. As if our own mother, sister or daughter were being violated, we would not stand a second. We would call 911 over and over again. We would do anything humanly possible in our home with our friends and families to stand in support of our daughter, our mother, our sister. We must evolve to that level of intimacy. We must rise up, each of us worldwide leaders, in support of a revolution of the spirit. Burma right now, 54 million people, like it was just one small family, they are being violated in some of the grossest human rights violations that we have seen in modern time. Courage. To see the truth, to feel the truth, to act on behalf of the truth. And she closed by saying, United Nations, the revolution that we have in our country is the courage to care about 
principles and values and people beyond our own self-interest. And if enough people, she concluded with me, United Nations, do this, our revolution in Burma for freedom and democracy will be achieved, but we cannot do it alone. Everyone in the country must empower their will, their courage to be in duty to this revolution of human consciousness for freedom and democracy and rule of law in their home, in their society, in their country, in the globe, a global family, United Nations. We are a family and protect and support the people of Burma just as you would, Xi Jinping, your own wife, your own family, your own selected group of intimates. Let's overcome sanctified apartheid, the protocol of evil, and crash that ancient narrative of separation and act for the betterment of Do Aung San Suu Kyi, the civilian leaders of that country, the incarcerated boys and girls and men and women in the prisons in Burma, courageously act to protect them creatively in every way, shape and form right now without hesitation. So may this aditant, as we say in Dhamma, this conviction, this chaitana, this intention be so rooted in truth, may the forces of the angels, the deities, the devas, the brahmas, Buddhas to be, bodhisattvas everywhere in all dimensions of existence, all forces of purity and wisdom, may they come to support the vocation of this aditant, that what I am saying is rooted in truth, and may all deities, all devas, all brahmas, all Buddhas to be, right now in all lokas, all aryas, all enlightened beings everywhere, come to support the people of Burma at this very moment. May all the forces come and shock the people of Burma into freedom. Release Do Aung San Suu Kyi, release the people in the prisons, and give democracy and peace and freedom a chance to expand like we've never seen before in modern times. So from my heart to yours, thank you for being in my life. And we stand in solidarity with you in Burma. I'll see you tomorrow uh, for part three of my tribute to Do Aung San Suu Kyi in defense of freedom and for the people of beloved Burma. Thank you.